Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, it's an honor and great fun to join you today for the sixth and final program of the Oxford Smart Space Series. Uh, today we're going to discuss space venturing and try to figure out how space venturing differs from other sectors. Um, the space sector is growing at an unprecedented pace, which really makes us uh, want to think about this. Uh, prominent in the news, of course, are a few wealthy individuals who are doing things and uh, their ventures. But thousands of new companies are forming in the commercial space sector. And these work alongside with uh, space agencies of various countries, uh, governments, aerospace primes, uh, both public and private. And they get funding from public and private and even customers beyond governments are developing. In this panel today, we'll explore the relationship between the space sector, you know, the intense cost requirements, the intense new technology requirements, and the immense expense that's going to happen if you want to do business in space with much less evident near-term financial results and significant governance concerns. I mean, who regulates what's going on in space and uh, who cleans up your mess afterward? I'm Robert Eberhardt. Uh, I direct research at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business, where I study entrepreneurship and how it shapes society. Um, by the way, I have my PhDs in management science from Stanford University, and I have publications which span uh, theoretical constructs of how institutional change has complex effects on new firms and how entrepreneurship is changing society. Relevant to space, I was also a staff scientist at Berkeley Space Science Lab, where I designed and built and conducted interferometry observations of new exoplanetary systems. And yes, I can speak to business before my academic career. I was a partner at Pacific Rim Partners, uh, a venture capital firm, and I was a founder and CEO of Wine and Style uh, in Tokyo, Japan, which distributed capital, Jap uh, California wines to the Japanese market. Uh, before Wine and Style was executive in the semiconductor business here in Silicon Valley. I'm joined today by three spectacular individuals who will no doubt offer unique and insightful perspectives on our question today. Uh, first, may I present Ms. Candace Johnson. Uh, Ms. Johnson is, has a long and distinguished career as the founder and co-founder of, of space ventures such as SES Astra, SES Global, Laurel Teleport Europe, um, Europe Online, and she's played critical roles in bringing about the space sector leaders, including Rudium and ILS. She's a cap venture capitalist and investor. She's been a member of the Strategic Committee for the Irish Capital for the past decade, and recently was the president of the European Business Angel Network, and is now president emeritus. Um, she served on numerous boards, and she's a founding president of VATM, the Association of Private Telecom Operators, and co-founder, as if all that wasn't enough, of the Global Telecom Women's Network, and uh, the co-founder of the Middle East and North African Business Angel Network and the African Business Angel Network. And I'm very proud that she's joined us today. Um, next, uh, we have Mr. Mike Lawton, who's also a spectacular and varied individual. He's an Oxfordshire-based uh, serial entrepreneur. He's the founder of Oxford Space Systems, uh, an internationally and multi-award winning space technology business based in the Harwell Space Cluster. Uh, it's ranked, by the way, number 52 in the top 100 uh, UK fastest growing companies uh, back in 2018. Um, the company's seen really as an exemplar of UK success story in space. Uh, but OSS is not Mike's only play. It's his third technology business. His other adventures include remote technology business uh, uh, around biofuel technology and a joint venture in India, which won him a title of Green Entrepreneur for India in 2009. Um, he's been awarded the Barclays Bank Startup Entrepreneur of the Year in 2018. Uh, uh, just numerous awards the, from Space System to the Oxfordshire Business Person of the Year in 2018. Uh, and he's a keen supporter of all of our activities here at Oxford and across the UK uh, to get uh, space and technology businesses going in the UK. He's also assisted government agencies and uh, been part of uh, numerous uh, NATO innovation efforts. And finally, we have with us my dear friend, Dr. Alex McDonald, Alexander McDonald. Uh, Dr. McDonald is the chief economist at NASA. 
Uh, before that, he was the senior economic advisor to, uh, for the Office of the Administrator and was a founding the program executive of NASA's Emerging Space Office uh, with the Office of the Chief Technologist. He's an author. He's the author of a number of NASA reports, including emerging space including topics about emergency in space in the 21st century, how public-private partnerships uh, develop, and the economic development of businesses in low Earth orbit. Um, he's former executive in commercial space at uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, research faculty member at Carnegie Mellon University, and he's worked for a numerous uh, space research, including at uh, NASA Ames Research Center. Um, he got his undergraduate degree at Queen's University in Canada, his master's degree at the University of British Columbia, and he got his PhD at the University of Oxford. Um, okay, now for some housekeeping. Please ask questions using the chat function located somewhere on your screen uh, that some software, design decide, software designer uh, decided it was logical to put. Uh, it'll probably confuse us anyway, but uh, good luck in finding it. I'll happily pass these, ask these questions of the panelists as the appropriate opportunity arises. Okay, now let me please, uh, just let me set the stage for the discussion uh, today. Um, by the way, is this showing here? Let me see. Okay, good. Basically, the question I want to set up today is, you want to be a space entrepreneur. Let me make sure this is working. Sorry, technology. There we go. The question that I'm going to pose to these people, to our panelists today, is about the expense and return we're going to get out of doing something in space and the stage at which uh, business being con conducted. Because it's really, really expensive to do stuff in space. If you're just going to put a 100 kilogram object up there and use NASA to do it, they're going to charge you millions of dollars just to put it there. And once it's there, if somebody on the ISS touches it, that's going to cost millions of dollars more. And that's just to put 100, 100 pound or 100 kilogram package up there. Um, suppose we had to do this 50 times a year to generate revenue. Suppose we had to do had to put 36 uh, satellites in orbit to do some surveillance activity. Doing business in space is really, really expensive. And so far, the commercial reasons to go is kind of low. Basically, surveillance, looking down from above, data transfer, moving information around. And of course, navigation, weather, and trash cleanup are really basically government issues. Basically, it's colossally expensive to go. And in human cases, it's really hard to have people even survive in space. Yet, there's an investment frenzy going on. We have a 1,000 space adventures that got investments recently, and over $160 billion was invested since 2009. In fact, by some accounts, the space sector is the fastest growing uh, venture capital investment area in the United States. We started all this with kind of a business and government model. Uh, we all know about the Saturn V. The government demanded 12 of these. Um, and in 2010 dollars, those are about 36 billion dollars each. So you total that up, that's about half a trillion dollars of technical demand uh, that that rifled through the economy. And basically, the demand was advanced. The most uh, the you know we're purchasing the most advanced electronics um, machinery, and we had major advances in human capital, and, and particularly in organization and making things happen. Silicon Valley owes its existence, many people think, because of that program. Uh, the government demanded advanced electronics. It demanded advanced machinery. And so the government created a market for technology that wouldn't have existed otherwise. Of course, we slowed down and we stopped because basically it really can't sustain signal point um, uh, exploration with that kind of money. And the problem is that it was either going to become science purely with a small audience or exploitation with a private audience. And that's what we were kind of waited for. And maybe it's flowering now. But I don't think we should be pessimistic. After all, after Columbus' first voyage, it was 50 years for a major follow up and 103 years until anything commercial started going. Um, and the regular voyages that went between Europe and the United States were commercial. After all, this is what the world looked like to Columbus. And the initial voyages, just like in space were government funded. Um, and they used advanced technology of the time. 
um, to conduct their voyages. They weren't commercial or weren't successfully commercial. It took only about, a, it was about a hundred years later uh, that commercialization and settlement started, started happening uh, in the technology and the technology advanced to make that happen. Now we've just come from an exploratory phase in space. It took us 40 years to get from uh, Robert Goddard's first liquid fueled rockets uh, up to the first flight of the Saturn V. It slowed down a bit. It's taken 54 years to get this far, um, but the interests are different. Maybe it's not exploratory, it's, per, it's business. And of course the businesses are things like information is clearly obvious. Um, transportation, moving things up is now developing uh, uh, as, as a viable business. Um, there's tourism. Um, and I think some of these things are going to get going in two years as they were going to get going two years before that and get going two years before that. But it's probably going to happen in two years. And extraction is possible. Manufacturing even uh, might be done efficiently in space. But the limitations are important. How many transportation needs do we have a year that are not being uh, met? Um, tourism. This is really expensive. Um, Information, how much is unmet need and how much to go in extraction and mining and manufacturing. Basically, it's cheaper to do it here in almost every case. So the question we want to ask today, whatever you can do up there is vastly more complex and expensive. The energies required to get in orbit are colossal. If people are involved, the cost and complexity goes way up. All the initial oxygen, all the food has to be lifted up. Um, the implied expense and complexity suggests that a product or service will have to be very expensive and the customers therefore may be difficult to identify. So the question for our panelists today are, given the almost colossal cost of placing anything, especially humans into space, what specific money-making opportunities do you see excluding surveillance and data transfer that will present real commercial reasons for humans to live and work in space. And with that, I want to turn the stage over to my new friend, Ms. Johnson. Well, it's great to be here. And thank you so much for the introduction. You know, I don't agree with everything that you said. I'm a free marketeer. Um, my father started the first, well, he worked on the first satellites for the United States Air Force and then he, our government, and then he actually started Westar, which was the first private domestic satellite. Um, I myself uh, started uh, SES Astra in 1983. Uh, today it is um, Luxembourg's largest individual taxpayer and uh, very, very uh, successful. Um, I was, everything that I've done, I've always done in terms of, of, of privately financed, commercially oriented space. And I'd also just like to mention that, you know, you mentioned what I had done, but today currently I'm the chair of Seraphim Space Corporate Advisory Board. Um, and you may have just seen that we are doing an IPO. It's on our website, so I can talk about it. And uh, it's the world's first publicly, uh, first uh, uh, space fund to go on the stock exchange. So we're very, very excited about this. I'm the vice chair of North Star, which is doing uh, space situational awareness and hyperspectral um, uh, earth observation. Uh, I am uh, one of the co-founders of Oceania Women's Network Satellite, which is, um, which is one of the first and largest investors in Pacific, and we're bringing broadband internet to the Pacific Islands. So um, obviously, I think that there are a lot of uh, opportunities uh, for commercial um, success in space. Things ha some things have not changed. One, it's always a question of the bang for the buck. And this is, you know, from the very beginning. And secondly, you know, I think also my dad told me that, you know, when they first put up the first satellites, everybody said, oh, Johnny, you know, that's great, but what are we going to do with this? And then he always, you know, completed the question by saying, and from that point on, human in ingenuity and human imagination has always found new uh, uses for space. 
So I, I see, obviously, I mean, we are in the golden era of space because of the democratization, because of the miniaturization of components. I remember telling some Russian entrepreneurs, don't come and talk to me until, um, you know, we can have $1,000 for one kilo. Um, and, you know, we're pretty much there. Um, so, um, you know, the, the, I, I see so many opportunities. I am an entrepreneur. So uh, one, I think definitely telecommunications is still very much a, um, uh, uh, a, a great source of, um, of uh, profit generation. Um, sustainability, you, you know, you talked about earth observation, but quite frankly, it's much more about the environment, about climate change, um, space satellites, actually fulfill all of the SDGs, um, everything having to do with resilience. We need to have resilience and so in case something happens, you know, space is there as, as a backup. Um, uh, everything having to do with IoT today, everything that is, uh, ha you can put a sensor on everything and you can collect that data and work on it and bring it down. Um, you also have, and uh, I know that I only have three minutes, so I'll go, I'll go quickly here. Um, obviously, insurance, the, the whole insurance industry is being uh, disrupted. Beforehand, they used to insure satellites. That's not so much the case. Uh, it's not their biggest money generator. They have to find new ways of insurance, but to use space for insuring cars, bicycles, buildings, all which have sensors, um, et cetera. Also, I'd like to just talk real quickly about the patents on new technology that um, could be developed in space, but which would be used on Earth. You know, if we think about the cell phone, if we think about Gore-Tex, that was those were technologies that were developed when we first went to the moon. Um, I'm talking now about renewable energy, uh, quantum computing, um, new types of um, uh, of textiles new types of energy, all which can be developed and then put down here uh, on, on Earth. So um, I am very excited, obviously, about the financial returns and the um, immaterial returns uh, of investing in space uh, for our universe and our planet and our humanity. Thank you so much for those fascinating remarks. I enjoyed every perspective you just gave there. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just glad you joined us. Uh, <laughs> and next, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Mike Lawton to uh, give his share his perspectives and thoughts. And yes, my slides were hopefully deliberately provocative, so go for it. <laughs> great. Thanks, Robert. Uh, well, Candice touched on a lot of great points there, and I'm going to stick to the exam question that you set, so not talk about uh, earth observation and and data relay but those are of course i think the reason you excluded them is because there are great examples where there are many companies being very commercially successful today including candace's company SES, uh, phenomenal revenues profit generating from the use of space assets so yeah it's very expensive to get hardware on orbit but that doesn't mean even today there's some fantastic business models uh, to, to be had and of course direct to home television has really dominated uh, and given us examples of some of those profitable space businesses currently um, uh, around. But to, um, uh, to make an observation, um, I think it's very easy to criticize a young fledgling industry and try to you know, kind of almost snub it off on, on the vine before it even grows. Of course, it's expensive. Like any new technology, it's always incredibly expensive. And I'm reminded of some of the comments made by, I think it was the chairman of IBM, whose own company actually thought the world would not actually really need their technology. And I think he's famously on record as saying in the late 50s, very early 60s, the world would never need more than five mainframe computers because he just couldn't see the use of them. But where are we today? We all carry around uh, a computer that's way more powerful than IBM's product with us everywhere. In fact, we've probably got several on, on our bodies. Uh, and we had the same with the mobile phone industry. When they were first launched, they were, no one's ever gonna buy this technology. It's way too cumbersome, way too expensive. But of course, technology advances, cost collapse, and now it becomes ubiquitous. So I think we're at the very, very early stages of a phenomenally exciting and lucrative industry. But to directly answer your question, where I think those first uh, or additional exciting revenues are going to come from, you touched on it, space tourism. 
it's an obvious place to start. You can target high net worth individuals, suborbital flights in reality rather than getting to orbit initially. But that's a, a fast turnaround business with no end of people queuing up to put down a quarter of a million dollars to get that first 90 minute flight. And of course, I think it's going to follow the same trajectory as commercial flight. When we first started having commercial aircraft, once again, it was only the preserve of the incredible rich uh, to, to, to t take part in, the, in, that, uh, in that technology. But with advances, uh, we can now all fly to different continents. Well, if you live in the UK, you can actually fly overseas cheaper than it is to get a train uh, to put technology into, into context. So I think tourism is probably going to be the, the next lucrative industry. Uh, and then I'm very excited about manufacturing of novel materials on, on orbit. If you can get into low Earth orbits, you're now free of uh, micro, you're free of the Earth's gravity and effects like sed sedimentation. So you can produce very high purity diamonds, much larger than we can produce on, on Earth. So I think that's going to open up some very uh, interesting avenues. And sidestepping or bypassing the issue of lifting all the materials that we need on orbit. I think there's going to be very interesting uh, developments and opportunities for recycling on orbit. Most satellites don't, don't wear out. They simply run out of fuel and end up pointing in the wrong direction. But they still have very usable electronics, materials, solar panels. You know, we spent hundreds of millions getting very high value, high purity materials on orbit. Let's recycle them. So I would imagine space robotics and the use and recycling of on-orbit materials is going to be a growth uh, industry. Uh, and then much, much further out, extraction and mining of, of asteroids. Incredibly highly pure, highly valuable uh, assets orbiting our, our solar system. If you're free of the Earth's turbulent weather systems and plate tectonics, which churn all the minerals and ores together, we have fantastically pure, incredibly high value, running to trillions of dollars in orbit in our solar system. It makes hell of a lot of sense to secure those, bring them back to low Earth orbit and mine them there. So, well, there's my crystal ball uh, and uh, look forward to getting into deeper discussion as we go on. Uh, just absolutely terrific. And uh, I can't wait to uh, give my wife one of these huge diamonds that you manufacture. Um, beats the tiny little thing I gave her when we got married. <laughs> uh, now I'd like to switch the stage to uh, my friend, Dr. Alex uh, McDonald, and um, so I hear some insights from uh, NASA. Well, uh, thanks, Bob, and uh, it's been a pleasure uh, listening to all the comments so far. Uh, I think I agree with many of them, actually, even the ones that are uh, mutually contradictory. Uh, you know, for me, to answer the exam question as it was put, right, I think it's also important to, to figure out how we got to where we are today. So uh, literally today, we have 10 people living and working in space. And uh, interestingly, uh, as of yesterday, we now have two different vehicles on which we live. Uh, the International Space Station, of course, has been continuously inhabited for over 20 years, uh, which is a significant accomplishment that we're, we're very proud of at NASA and, and we're proud of uh, the international partnership that uh, has allowed that to happen. But as of yesterday, uh, a new space station uh, built by China just received three crew members, and the intent is for that station to also be permanently inhabited. Uh, so this is a really exciting moment. So thinking about you know where we might be going in the future, uh, you know, as an economic historian, I, I tend to think it's it's at least sometimes useful to think about how we got here. And from my perspective, how we got here is a, is a mix of both supply side and demand side phenomena. And on the supply side, what we have is a number of people who for literally uh, well over 100 years have, for whatever intrinsic reasons they have, uh, decided that they want a future where humanity travels into space and lives amongst the stars. And for also over 100 years, individuals have dedicated their, their life and, and therefore their labor hours to making that uh, future possible. They have built rocket companies. Uh, you know, we, we are very excited about the current uh, venture capital uh, kind of explosion in, in the space sector. Um, but the very first venture capital backed uh, company was uh, uh, Reaction Motors Incorporated, which was funded in the 1940s by Laurent Rockefeller. So a lot of this isn't as new as we think. Uh, but that's actually what has allowed us to get here. We've had generations of people supplying their labor to try to make a future for humanity and space possible. 
Uh, and that really kind of covers the supply side. Obviously, a certain amount of people need to be uh, you know, paid for their, their labors, but not everybody. Some uh, early innovation was done by people who basically sell finance. Uh, and that's an important source of, uh, of labor and development as well. But then the question is, well, where do you get the really massive amounts of money that uh, Bob was referring to to kind of get the Apollo program going, to, to get, the, uh, get the Mercury program going? Um, well, in my analysis, you know, that really comes from uh, essentially the demand uh, originally by nation states, but now increasingly from individuals for uh, signaling goods. And uh, I'm sure many folks uh, here are fam familiar with signaling, but it's essentially uh, a, a, an action, a costly action that can credibly transmit information uh, about the person undertaking that action. And so in the context of spaceflight, one of the reasons that uh, spaceflight was so uh, important geopolitically during the Cold War was that it was very costly. It was very uh, complex and uh, undertaking it and executing it uh, credibly transmitted information about the nation states that were doing it. Uh, that is now also true for individuals. And uh, so I, I think the signaling function is, is a big part of, of the demand side of the equation of how we have currently uh, inhabited platforms in space. And if you think about it at the geopolitical level, uh, what's interesting about signaling is that you can, uh, as a geopolitical actor, you can signal a desire for, for, for a competitive posture, uh, but you can also signal a desire for a cooperative posture. And, uh, you know, the International Space Station is very much a function of the latter. Uh, and it is, uh, you know, 20 years going strong, and, and, and we think we've got another good decade in it yet. Um, so that is kind of sufficient to get us to where we have uh, gotten to and, and where we might be going for a little bit you know, uh, further still, but uh, combination of signaling and the intrinsic motivations of individuals uh, will, uh, I think, be able to take us to certainly uh, more people in orbit than the 10 we have today. Uh, and also, I think it'll be able to take us to uh, uh, humans who are living and working around the moon. Certainly, uh, the next major national project that NASA is engaging with its partners is the Gateway Project, a uh, a, a, a crew tended uh, vehicle that will orbit the moon and which will be part of our overall Artemis uh, program that will return uh, humans to the surface of the moon. Uh, and so I think those, those forces will, will allow us to get there for sure. Um, the interesting thing from an economic perspective though is that once you're there, the marginal cost of doing new things is actually quite less. And that's where I think a lot of the stuff that Mike was referring to will come in, right? Um, not just the tourism, but also the cultural products. You know, think back to uh, Chris Hadfield when he uh, somewhat famously sang uh, David Bowie's uh, Ground Control to Major Tom from the space station uh, and uh, produced one of the early kind of YouTube breakout music videos from space. Uh, and the research uh, materials uh, activities are also really interesting activities that uh, can result in economic value. Uh, one of the ones that we're very excited about is we're seeing really significant results in terms of creating uh, better fiber optic cables in space uh, for things like laser applications uh, because in microgravity and also when there's no convection, uh, you can actually have the fiber optic uh, cables be potentially uh, made with a, a much higher transparency, which, which opens up new applications. So that's just the start. Uh, of where we are, uh, and I think we're, we're, we're definitely on a trajectory to be increasing the number of people living in space, and it'll be fun to see what happens as a result. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, it's always fun to be on a panel with people smarter than me, and uh, it's uh, really cool. Uh, I really enjoyed this uh, idea of signaling, and I never thought of it that way before in your other insights, so thank you very, very much. Um, I want to uh, move to questions now. Um, I have a couple of my own that I'm going to switch to the, the audience questions. Um, first, um, for any of the panel, much of the opportunities that uh, Mike and Candace talked about, um, sustainability, climate change, um, you know, another place to be, uh, these suffer from the tragedy of the commons. I mean, how are you going to get somebody to pick up your trash? And, uh, you know, the climate change is multinational, right? And so how do we get everyone to participate or does one country have to do that? So I would like to think of how you're going to solve the tragedy of the commons as you do stuff in space. And then the second thing I'd like you to react to, and you can react in any order, um, much of what we're doing now 
um, appeals to a very small and very wealthy and affluent segment of the population. Somebody who can afford a $200,000 flight or buy diamonds, um, you know, or access much of the, uh, uh, this is a small segment of the population and are we solving problems uh, of ordinary people and people if they're rural? So let me just have the panel react to that for a minute or two and then we'll go to audience questions. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll take you, Thank you. again, and um, thank you, uh, and 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 here again. I, I think you're deliberately provoking me. Uh, so, well, <laughs> first of all, you know, we always say that it starts in space; it never ends in space. And so, really, anything that we do when we're sending signals, collecting signals, etc., they really, um, you know, th 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 there is a, a much, much exponential more exponential use when you talk about the tragedy of the of the commons and 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 people picking up um uh debris i'm actually working with indonesia at the moment which will be um the g20 uh, meeting place for uh, 2022 next year and they have a really big problem with um trash and so what uh, what I'm suggesting to them is to indeed use, first of all, the broadcast opportunity of space, which we all know is great, mass consumer uh, broadcast to get the message out, and then to inspire the, um, the, 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 the mass community to pick up the trash and to also do this by using AI, etc. So I think that there's a real opportunity there. And and um, uh, that you know it, that the space can be used to also uh, solve the problem, also with the the mass broadcasting uh, part. And then, then the second thing, you know, you talk about um, tourism and and diamonds and everything. You know, quite frankly, that is not at all where I see the opportunities. Uh, the opportunities are are really with the young kids today. You know, when I was six, uh, which was 62 years ago, I was, you know, building my own transistor radio. Um, then a couple of years ago, people were building their computers. And now kids are building their own satellites and their own rockets. And, and they're doing it usually not for the you know the big profit and everything these kids are doing it because they think that they can use space to help us create a better world so um yeah wonderful thank you so much really really good mike you want to take a swatch at that yeah 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 i'll, I'll dive in yeah i, I use the, quite often use the term the kind of nirvana syndrome or nirvana complex you know there's always the argument of why are we spending a huge amount over here when we haven't solved all the problems kind of over here um, well, that's not, that's not how mankind is. You know, why did we start exploring overseas when we had problems with plague and illness back at home? Why did the realm spend a huge amount to go and explore? Because, well, we always do that. Humans are natural creatures of, of exploration, and we are going to do that. It's just in our nature. Um, but that doesn't mean it's dead money. When we explore, we discover, we bring back new materials or we invent new materials. We discover new medicines, new way of curing diseases, new, way, new ways of being sufficient. How do we purify water? So we have all these ripple benefits from what perhaps initially look like superfluous use of, of money and a waste of time uh, and activity. And I'm sure Alex will dive in uh, on, on NASA's side. I think 8,000 plus patents developed by NASA most of which are being employed um, terrestrially and commercially. And most people probably don't realize Velcro was a byproduct of the space program. We have dried baby food, which is saving lives in developing countries as a direct result of our investment in, in space technology. And I could go on, there's many, many more. So I think it's a bit short sighted to, to say why, why spend money on space. And yes, it is still the preserve of some very rich high net worth individuals but so was every other industry when it first started. Cars, transportation, aircraft, even crossing the Atlantic uh, initially, you had to be very wealthy. But as soon as money starts flowing into these industries, that's when we see uh, technology expansion, cost collapse, and then it becomes more and more accessible to everybody. I go back to my example of mobile phone. When it first launched, it was only the preserve of rich businessmen. Now it's unusual for people in developing nations not to actually have a digital mobile phone. So as I said, a very young industry, we're just getting going. We will see these benefits, but just give it time. We need the investment and the development.
Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm one who delights in that optimism. Thank you very, very much. Um, hey, Alex, do you have anything to add here? Yeah, sure. Mike did a great job of the, uh, the spinoff argument, as, as, as we sometimes like to call it. So I'll, I'll, I'll not repeat that there. But uh, I do want to pick up on your on your uh, your space debris and the tragedy of the commons um, aspect there, Bob. Um, you know, it, it's very interesting when when uh, we were first going into space in the 1960s, there was a real international understanding that uh, space problems were global problems, that that really if we're going to address uh, our challenges in space, we're going to need global cooperation. And that was something that really was uh, quite literally, you know, uh, established as, as global law through things like the Outer Space Treaty. Um, and, and, and one of the things that I think is, 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 is a challenge going forward is that I think we've, we've had a bit of a practical erosion of that over the last couple of decades. And uh, some of that comes from uh, obviously uh, military activities, uh, the, the kind of emergence of uh, ASAT tests, uh, essentially anti-satellite tests that, uh, that, that basically destroy satellites in orbit uh, and then produce a significant amount of debris. Um, so far, we've only had tests of these things, but should this ever become an actual uh, war fighting issue, as in fact a number of militaries around the world have suggested um, they are preparing for, uh, space debris might become a, a, a literally quite un, uncontrollable and unmanageable problem. And, and, and I think we're at some significant risk of that happening. Um, similarly, we have, uh, you know, in our in our enthusiasm for uh, for for new commercial activities, and, and quite quite rightly, we have encouraged a significant expansion of satellites. We're now looking at constellations of tens of thousands of satellites uh, in orbit, which uh, even in the kind of uh, the '90s during the teledesic era, we weren't quite really uh, you know imagining things of quite that scale. Certainly not multiple constellations of that scale simultaneously. Um, and, and, and I don't think we've really uh, kind of figured out how this is really going to be managed from a space debris perspective for the decades to come. Um, there haven't really been a, a significant set of agreements internationally between uh, the nation states. Um, and even within nation states, there's not always agreement with an industry about how we should manage these things. So um, I think it's a real challenge. Uh, I think it's actually going to be one of the most significant challenges for the decades to come. And uh, I hope some of the folks listening to uh, this conversation uh, will look into that. And, and I agree also, Kenneth, that there are, of course, business opportunities in that. Uh, but the business opportunities are, are downstream, let's say, of uh, interna international coordinated action, um, because these things are, 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 are going to require significant investment to address. So, uh, hey. If I may, if I may, of course. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, Alex, uh, you know, I did say I am the vice chair of North Star, and we're doing space situational awareness and space traffic management, just to um, you know solve that problem of space debris, which it can be very, very bad because what it happens is, you know, besides you know messing up the universe, uh, it it has more for potent uh, for um, uh, for um, when con uh, collisions, uh, et, et cetera. So the, we are working on this. We're the first space-based, space situational awareness company in the world. Uh, we agree with you. It is absolutely uh, um, a huge problem that needs to be solved. I'd always tell everybody, it's like when, you know, cars were on the road, they didn't have any traffic management. And so, you know, now we have so many satellites in space we need to put into place not only rules for space traffic management, but also a way how to monitor them and um, and, and and avoid the collisions. So uh, I agree with you. It's it's um it's it's a Fantastic. very exciting place to be in. Yeah, Mike, just, did you have a comment? Or go, sorry, Alex. Didn't no, I just want to say I'm glad to hear that, Candace. There, and you know, maybe maybe that will hopefully mean that Luxembourg may uh, kind of take a lead in in, in space debris yeah. international coordination in the same way that it's taken the lead over the last ten years in space resources. I think that would be wonderful to see. Well, that's true. Watch the space. <laughs> yeah, that's just, that's just terrific, and uh, we could we could probably spend hours on how we're going to get these international agreements going when we can't seem to agree on almost anything else. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, let me go to some of the audience questions now because we've been asked a number of absolutely fascinating questions. Uh, for example, from Chris at Oxford, uh, wants to know is private investment, uh, and we have you here, more inve interested in space solutions to help things on Earth or in general space exploration infrastructure to go and focus outward? Mike, why don't you grab that first? 
I, I would say knowing the investors that, I, that I've worked with, uh, it's all about the financial return. And unfortunately, um, investors, venture capitalists are, are bound by typically the life of the fund. And that's around about 10 years. So it means invariably you've got to focus on investing in those businesses that are going to give a return to the fund in, in a pretty quick time. And unfortunately for the space sector, that does mean space as a service. You're delivering something pretty quickly that you can start generating revenue on in the next couple of years, or with, at least within the life of the fund to increase the value of the company that's received that investment. Uh, unfortunately, I think things like space infrastructure and space exploration, you know, asteroid mining, are currently beyond the, the ability or the interest zone purely because of the financial constraints on existing funds. And that's why I think it's still the preserve of, of entities such as you know, ESA and, and NASA, those that aren't bound by short term time horizons. Um, yeah, it, so yeah, th that's, uh, that's a long winded way of saying it's all about the immediate returns and therefore it is very uh, focused on commercial returns uh, for I think space based businesses rather than infrastructure. Thank you. Um... Okay, let me go to another question, unless the rest of you want to jump in there. Um, real, real quickly, if I may, two points. Okay. Uh, first of all, you know, SES, 1983, the first money that we got was from an angel investor, Count Roland de Kergolet, $1 million at the time. We didn't even have a euros. And so angel investors um, uh, can have what we call patient capital. Yeah. They're like, you know, infrastructure, family offices, etc. So, so that is why you see a lot of angel investors in space. The second thing is that with our Seraphim uh, IPO, we are doing an evergreen fund so that we don't have that problem about the time limit. Fantastic. Okay. Um, I'm interested. Daisuke from Japan is asking us, how do we accelerate or attract more attention to you know from the non-space related companies to get them interested in opportunities in the space market. Um, boy, who wants to grab that first? No, I'll, I'll actually take a quick one at that. Um, Thanks, man. You know, it's uh, it, it's a great question. It's actually one that uh, is kind of a long-standing area of interest for lots of people uh, thinking about how do we how do we build up you know space economic activity in general. Um, and it, it's interesting, you know, uh, Bob kind of showed some of the early costs that it, you know, it, that, that it costs to send money to the space station. Uh, but actually, in many respects, that policy uh, was put in place uh, uh, relatively recently to allow for exactly the kind of thing that you're talking about. And, and in Japan, JAXA has been doing similar activities uh, in terms of, you know, sending up yeast uh, for, I think there was a, a Kirin space beer, right? Um, and uh, I think this is one of the things that commercialization can enable is that, uh, you know, while it may not be really worth uh, government subsidy to enable that, and in fact, uh, you know, we've received, you know, kind of direction from, from the U.S. Congress that, that we shouldn't be subsidizing these types of activities, such as marketing activities, for example, on the International Space Station. Uh, that's not because people don't want them to happen, right? People are very interested in a, a, a commercial market emerging out of that, and I really think that that's going to be something that is going to be a, a, an interesting growth area, uh, because once you have uh, private suborbital vehicles, private orbital vehicles, um, whatever business arrangement you can arrange to take whatever you can, you know, uh, pay someone to take up, uh, you can get that engagement at a, at a much lower marginal cost than has ever been possible before. Um, so I, I think really it's it, it just comes down to. Figuring out what uh, what what business engagement you want to want to have, figuring out how much it costs, what the minimum viable product in that area is going to be, and uh, you know, seeding those types of ideas across as uh, as many industries as, as you think are are, are worth seeding. Oh, thank you very very much. Um, let me move on to another question that I just think is a fascinating thing to talk about. Uh, Chris from uh, the United Kingdom wants to know why all these Americans. Um, sorry. Um, has questions of, uh, he wants to know about questions of data privacy with reconcile with the pro data transmission in space. Mm. I mean, you know, it's one thing when it's in your office and you can move it around, but you're going to transmit it across the world, basically, where anybody can pick it up at least once a day. And uh, many countries have people that can decode stuff. So um, 
yeah, how do we reconcile the needs of privacy and having people's information up there? And Candace, you seem eager, so go for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I read that question and I said, I, I it's like somebody put put the question in for, for us. Uh, so uh, one of the companies that Seraphim has in, 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 um, invested in is a company called Arkit. And it's from the UK, Chris, it's from the UK. And we are basically doing quantum uh, computing via satellite in the cloud. And we are, uh, and, and when I say we, I mean the our portfolio company is distributing the key, the security key in the most encrypted uh, uh, safe solution that you can possibly use. So this is really, um, uh, it, it is absolutely, um, I'll just read a little bit. Quantum Cloud puts a lightweight agent at any endpoint device. This software creates an unlimited number of symmetric keys with partner devices. The process is very simple and fast, but is powered by quantum satellites in the cloud. And you can read more about it under ARCID. But I saw that question. I said, whoa, I can read it. So. Fantastic. Anyone else want to grab that too? All right. Well, let me move on to. They are doing an IPO and they're valued at 1.4 Fantastic. And more power to them. And I have great confidence in any company that tells me that my information is secure. Yeah. Um, let me see. Uh, let me go to question. Interesting question for Laurent in Luxembourg. Um, he asks, when is this going to happen? When are we going to get a profit out of uh, recycling and reuse in low earth orbit? It's a good proposition, but boy, when is this going to happen? We're going to start generating cash. Mike, I think this works for you. Uh, I, I think it's like saying when we're going to start seeing profit from recycling companies on earth. You know, it's incredibly tough to make a recycling business highly profitable terrestrially. Um, so I think those challenges extend to orbit. I, I think it actually comes down and starts with those designing spacecraft, because at the moment, every satellite and spacecraft built has not been designed to be disassembled on orbit. So I think it needs to start with appropriate design techniques. Uh, and it probably will start with some of the most complex and expensive structures to, to start recycling. So for instance, uh, one of the challenges is having large aperture antennas on orbit, either for communication link or, or, or Earth observation. So very expensive, very high risk structures. So once they've deployed and locked into place, that's really a high value asset. You would love to be able to take from, uh, from an old satellite where perhaps the electronics is, is aged and you don't really want to use that generation of hardware anymore, but you still want that fundamental foundation bit of technology such as the antenna. Uh, and also solar panels. Uh, yes, they degrade when they when they're when they're on orbit, but they still have a useful end of life energy. And once again, a solar array, a solar array is an incredibly complex bit of technology. And once it's deployed on orbit, that's a really useful bit of hardware to potentially transplant to to another satellite. Um, so it starts with design. When's it going to happen? Your crystal ball is probably as accurate as mine. But work is taking place uh, to understand things like robotic systems, how we manipulate satellites on orbit, how we engage with satellites. Those technologies are being developed and demonstrated today. But until someone makes money, yeah, that's the tough one. Yeah, yeah, OK. I really appreciate that and good no, no, answer. Hey, that, uh, go, please, uh, Alex. Just because it's, it's a good example of you know where you stand depends on where you sit. So. Uh, from the perspective of human spaceflight uh, and space stations, uh, we're already there. We uh, already invest significant amount of money in improving our water and uh, oxygen recycling processes. Um, and in fact, that's because if we're going to uh, successfully get to, to Mars and back, uh, you know, still, even if we have significant transformations in the cost of launch, every, every kilogram of mass is still going to be very expensive and even more so for interplanetary human missions. And that puts a premium uh, at uh, recycling your water, uh, which is one of your, your high mass activities or your high mass uh, kind of uh, support functions that you need uh, for that mission. So we've already been, been investing uh, millions of dollars in recycling uh, water systems and improving recycling water systems uh, for decades. And we continue to expect to uh, do that for, for decades to come. Uh, because it's actually a really critical enabling technology for interplanetary human spaceflight. 
Thank you very, very much. Um, when we uh, worked with the State Department and Japan and JAXA on uh, opportunities for space, one of the main things we thought is exploration of Mars and even farther would generate um, technologies and recycling and biomass and how we stay alive for that period of time with limited resources, which seems to be really relevant. So that's really cool. Hey, um, one more, uh, and well, I hope we have time for a few more, but this is one I think uh, I'd like to ask Alex and then uh, David from Istanbul asks us, does innovation in space require international conflict? Do we have to be in tension and competition with other countries to make this happen? Yeah, that's that's a great question, David. And, um, you know, I, I, I think the International Space Station uh, really proves that it doesn't. Um, and, and, and I don't say that lightly, right? I mean, it, 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 we can't underestimate um, the, the significant role that you know, national security and, and military demand has played in, in the development of, uh, of, the, of the basic enabling technology of spaceflight, which of course is rocketry. Um, you know, Robert Goddard, who was kind of the first space entrepreneur in the US, uh, he interestingly enough got most of his money throughout his multi-decade career pursuing liquid fuel rocketry from uh, the Guggenheim family. Uh, but he was convinced that he would not be able to get to space until he finally got uh, military funding. And of course, when the very first uh, rocket breached the atmosphere of the Earth and got into uh, you know, the approximate vacuum of space, it was in fact a military rocket, the V-2, uh, that achieved that. And, and uh, you know, ICBMs are, are the result of, of both uh, conflict and uh, space entrepreneurial passion around the world, um, which is not something we should, we should kind of take lightly. Um, but I think, you know, humans have a, a great capacity uh, for, you know, at least wanting a better world as well. And the International Space Station is, is really one of the most uh, beautiful expressions I can think of on that. Um, you know, if you're not familiar with the history in the uh, State of the Union address in the 1980s, uh, Ronald Reagan kind of stood up in front of Congress and said that uh, the U.S. was going to build a, a space station, Space Station Freedom. And it was going to do it with uh, its international partners. At the time, uh, that was Canada, uh, the European Space Agency, uh, and uh, Japan. Uh, but over the course of uh, a decade or so, as, as the project developed, uh, and then the, the Soviet Union fell, replaced by the, you know, the Russian Federation, uh, it, it actually became a U.S. foreign policy goal to incorporate Russia, a former adversary, into this project, uh, in part because they had, of course, very significant human spaceflight capabilities, but also because it was recognized that a partnership here could potentially prevent um, some of the, the aerospace workforce from you know, maybe selling their services and their expertise uh, for potentially destabilizing military technologies elsewhere. And that's been incredibly successful. I mean, we're, we're now literally 30 years on from, from that, uh, that foreign policy decision. And even though we have a lot of challenges, obviously, uh, between the US and Russia today, uh, our partnership in space is incredibly strong. Uh, we could not be operating the International Space Station without our Russian partners. And I think it really is a true example of the ability of, of humans around this world to uh, cooperate together on important projects, to muster our resources, to uh, achieve kind of wondrous results that can inspire people to maybe be more cooperative uh, than competitive in the future. And I'm very hopeful that uh, we're going to see future such uh, results. We already know we have one project in the making, uh, which is the Gateway, as I mentioned, and that is a partnership that's already been agreed upon uh, by Canada, Europe, and Japan. Uh, but the world is returning to the moon. Uh, it's not just the US, it's, it's a number of international uh, parties. And uh, my hope is that we will find an ability to cooperate again on the lunar surface uh, in peace, um, just like we have in low Earth orbit but that's not guaranteed. And so uh, all of us who care about that around the world, uh, I hope we all act to try and make that future uh, the one that we uh, the one that we live in, that we, we end up acting to live in that timeline rather than some of the other timelines that we might find ourselves in. Excellent uh, answer. In fact, um, I, if anyone wants to add in, we only got one minute left before I was I gonna say, I give you another great example of innovation that doesn't come from conflict or competition, uh -huh. and it's kickstarted an entire element of, of the space sector. And that's the CubeSat. 
that was born out of the frustration of uh, of a US professor wanting to introduce students to space engineering, frustrated at the cost. So thought that must be a cheaper way of doing this and came up with a low cost form factor, which then spawned the CubeSat industry. Yeah, fantastic. All right, um, we're five minutes before and so um, I have to leave some of these fantastic questions aside. Uh, but I do want to thank each of the panelists for their wisdom. Um, I'm inspired and I'm glad they took up the challenge uh, that I proposed to them of, look, this is kind of a waste of time. It's really expensive. And I think you've answered that uh, beautifully. Um, I'd like to make just some quick closing remarks. I think you've clearly shown the profit potential and the commercial potential of space and also the way that this works to generate cooperation and uh, good feelings, basically, among nations. Um, I also want to point out that it's pretty obvious that it still can remain an inspiration for youth. People want to get involved in this. It was when, uh, certainly when I was a kid, I grew up with the space age. Um, and I think it still is doing that. And I think you pointed out how. I think one of the most interesting things that I heard today, though, was the hope that it gives us for cooperation between nations. This stuff is really expensive to do. The problems we have to solve are common. Um, they are shared problems that we have to solve. And I think all of you pointed out um, how both at the high level of developing uh, systems of cooperation between nations, but also at the commercial level, how we have to cooperate with other companies and systems down here to make, to develop, to solve our own problems. And some of these can only be done in space. Probably the solutions to uh, climate change are necessarily going to involve some space involvement. Um, I also like to think that what I like about this is I do think it parallels the historical uh, situation I put in the beginning. I think we've had our initial burst of expensive government funded exploration, which was inspirational for sure. Um, but we're still fulfilling, I think, a basic human need to go farther and explore. I think that's part of our nature. And I think by commercial interest picking this up, I think you have all demonstrated that we can fulfill that not only by paying taxes, but also by using services that we need. And I think we're right. We should see this developing and getting broader and more access to other people. Um, I think we all know that uh, uh, Mr. Benz created the first car, but Henry Ford made it available to people. And so I think we're looking for our Henry Ford. Anyway, I thank you all for your wonderful comments here. And I want to turn this over to Professor Ventresca for closing remarks. That's great, Bob. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Mark Ventresca. Uh, here uh, on the faculty at the University of Oxford in the uh, Side Business School and Wolfson College. Uh, very glad to join uh, for both the session today and the earlier five sessions. I want to thank Bob and the whole uh, set of uh, panelists today, Alex uh, and Candace and uh, Mike. What a, what a compelling and riveting debate, really, that we had. Uh, and I want to thank them, and I want to thank uh, the, the colleagues in the prior five sessions. This is, as you know, a six-episode series. Today's session really integrates and brings that to closure. Uh, just to briefly recap, we've run this series, Smart Space at Oxford, as an effort to make visible both research, venturing, uh, regulatory issues, and practical action in the emerging global uh, space sector. We've offered that uh, in the language of one of our colleagues, Lucas Kello in political science, We've called that smart space to do two things, to recognize that the contemporary era in space sector venturing and governance is smart in the conventional sense, that is making use of new technologies that transform what's possible. Also smart in the sense of being dependent on both the long-term continuity of public policy and government involvement, 
and the energy that comes from commercial activity. Over the six episodes, we've had a chance to reflect on technology, emerging technologies, and how they shift the adjacent possible. We've had a chance to think about governance, particularly the thinness of governance in the space sector today, and both the opportunities that's creating, but also the challenges. And there we've reflected on the range of new actors that are making claims in space that are able to launch, to take advantage of the uh, developments in inexpensive launch. And many, many kinds of actors now are site seeking to inhabit space and to use space and to make claims in space. That raises, I think, really powerful questions that we've continued in our research and also in teaching around the governance of the commons. Uh, we've had sessions on the changing expertise of space exploration and careers, uh, new kinds of skills, new kinds of uh, 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 skill sets and professionals and others coming in uh, to this domain. We've had a session on business innovation and venturing. We've talked about inclusive space, raising questions of both uh, demographic and also intellectual diversity. Who's involved in space? How does that shape what happens? What's the role of many emerging uh, Global South countries and agencies that are now also interested in space and bring with them a very different mindset from core exploration that characterized a NASA and ESA dominant era, now much more interest in what the panel today has spoken to, solving terrestrial problems, solving issues on Earth, the role of the SDGs, the, the work of the Sustainable Development Goals. As Bob said in those last few moments, many, many solutions for Earth and its challenges may only be found from the work in space. Um, we've also talked today about space venturing and comparative context. And again, I want to thank the team. I think there are a couple of quick themes I want to sound from the whole series. What we've learned, I think, we started out with a very familiar Latin phrase, ad astra, to the stars, to capture that, that millennial, millennium-based view of the fascination with the skies and what's out there and what's beyond there. Our colleague, uh, Eamon Malloy, quickly reminded us space has always been inhabited and the nature of that inhabiting has varied enormously over time and is varying more and more now. The, that idea from Ad Astra to now a focus on Earth-focused challenges and solutions is important. We've chronicled the variety of actors and the changing cast of actors, what they do in space and why they pursue initiatives in space. We've begun to address the very real challenges of governance uh, we begin to think now of the value of decades of investment in uh, space exploration and how that has changed our world already. We're now looking at a new era of investment, new kinds of investment, new kinds of actors, potentially new kinds of solutions, and also new challenges. I think everyone is familiar with the idea of the challenge of space debris. The legacy of all those efforts to go into space has created uh, literally pollution in the uh, uh, upper atmosphere and beyond. I think we've also really begun today and in this session in this series to reflect on the current plural promises of space commerce and what those ventures bode for both humankind and others. We've also begun to think more and more about the long arc of what I'm gonna call long journey human voyaging and settlements. And as you know, if you read the newspapers, the, the newspapers and the media, social media these days in the last year are marked by very lively debates about each one of these issues. So it reminds us how central and pervasive space sector activity is today for our lives now and also for the tomorrows that we want to build. I want to conclude very quickly with appreciation to many colleagues, really to my team in the Oxford Space Initiative. Uh, I want to call out specifically several of our research students and alumni Chris Magazzini, uh, Sally Edmondson, uh, Robin De DeMary, uh, David Lehman, Richard Johansson, Michele Scottolini, who've been stalwarts, who literally put this together. And by that, I mean, they recruited two dozen speakers from every sector, from every kind of expertise, the, the people who really were at the heart of these panels. I wanna acknowledge those uh, 20 people who have given their time and expertise. I also wanna recognize my faculty colleagues who have uh, moderated the panels. Uh, uh, and finally, a couple of key partners at Oxford Aerox, which is the Student Aeronautics Society, uh, colleagues at the Said Business School, colleagues at Pembroke College. I want to call out specifically at Said uh, Tiffany Franklin and her team who have done all the behind the scenes work 
that made these uh, panels, these episodes, fascinating, visible, and nearly flawless. Uh, I also want to thank Joe Fox, who's a senior colleague at the school, who really authorized and encouraged us to do this. So let me stop there again. Thank you for listening. All six episodes will be posted on the website. Uh, there's a real opportunity, I think, to learn uh, from these panels. As I said, we were fortunate to engage such an array of both distinguished, talented, and experienced people from the legacy uh, government space sector, the public sector activities, from uh, the transitional colleagues at places like SpaceX, who really pioneered new forms of initiative, new forms of exploring, often closely with government funding, the legacy of aerospace and defense primes, and now a generation of ventures and venture capitalists and angel investors who bring, again, heterogeneity of purpose and vision and possibility. Uh, I think the series uh, sits as a, as a quick primer for everyone who's interested to know more about space sector and space governance. And I really invite you to reach out to me and our colleagues at Oxford. We have a lively group in the social sciences. Uh, we are working closely with colleagues in the sciences, the, the basic scientists who are doing work on material science and robotics, photonics, laser, quantum, which is part of that legacy of new space and smart space. Uh, so again, thank you to many, many colleagues who made this possible. We look forward to being in conversation with you over time. Thank you very much. And uh, by the way,